My name is Christoph Straub and I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Learning here at TIFF. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a very special evening, uh, to the world premiere screening of Margaret Atwood, A Word After a Word After a Word is Power, with directors Nancy Lang and Peter Raymond in attendance. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge where tonight's event is taking place. We're on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and to support First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities by showing the works of Indigenous filmmakers here at TIFF. For instance, on November 12th, we're screening the world premiere of Thursa Jean Cuthands' short film, Woman Dress as part of the program Five at 50, an intimate look at contemporary LGBTQ2 plus lives and identities. Presented in partnership with the National Film Board of Canada, the screening will be followed by a discussion with Thursa, as well as filmmakers Michelle Pearson Clark, Tiffany Shung, Vivek Shraya, and Michael V. Smith, who are also presenting world premieres of their short film reflections on LGBTQ2 plus lives today and uh, in past lives. Tickets for this event we are, are still available at the box office or on TIFF.net. Now, on behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. Thank you also to our members and donors for their generous contributions to TIFF and to those who support TIFF's learning programs year-round. We'd also like to thank our programming partner for tonight's event, the Toronto International Festival of Authors, and big thanks to our presenting partners, White Pine Pictures and CBC Docs for providing us with the film. For tonight's event, we're pleased to be joined by Carol Off, host of CBC Radio's As It Happens. Carol has worked as an arts reporter and as an international CBC correspondent, covering the Middle East, the Balkans, Afghanistan, the United States, and the former Soviet Union. She's the best-selling, award-winning author of four books, and tonight she joins us as host and moderator. Please join me in welcoming Carol Off. Thank you, Chris. I am so pleased to be here in this room with so many people associated with Margaret Atwood. And so thank you for inviting me to be take on this role. Um, this is, as Chris just said, the world premiere of Margaret Atwood, a word after a word after a word is power. And I think I speak for many people, not just in this room, when I say it's about bloody time that somebody made this movie about this wonderful woman, right? We're having this special screening here tonight, but uh, you don't need to take notes or try to record this with your your iPhone, okay? So it's not like, I mean, I, have you seen those people like it's Superman where they're for 90 minutes filming it? You don't need to do that because actually the, the people's broadcaster will be giving you a screening of a shorter version of tonight's film on November the 14th. That's in one week's time. And then later you can see the entire documentary that you'll see tonight, you can tell your friends about this, will be on the documentary channel November the 19th. And then you can see it whenever your little heart desires on CBC Gym. So that's after that date. So turn off your phones. Um, sit back and enjoy tonight because it's so special. And uh, we'll be having this screening of the documentary, followed by a short Q&A with the people who directed the documentary, where I will attempt to tease out secrets for them, like, how did you ever get Margaret to agree to this? <laughs> and then we'll have a reception to which you're all invited and where you're likely to meet most of the people who are in the film. I'm going to invite the directors on stage to introduce the film. Nancy Lang is both an artist and a filmmaker. She has won multiple awards for her beautiful documentaries, including West Wind, The Vision of Tom Thompson, and Where the Universe Sings, The Spiritual Journey of Lauren Harris. Peter Raymond has been in the documentary business for more than 40 years, even before he founded the production company White Pine Pictures. His canon of award-winning films is way too long to tell you, but you have probably seen his other films about iconic Canadians, including the film Shake Hands with the Devil, The Journey of Romeo Dallaire, and Genius Within, 
the inner life of Glenn Gould. So please welcome to the stage the directors of tonight's film, Nancy Lang and Peter Raymond. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. We've got to get to the film, but first, uh, we just have a few thanks, uh, and I would like to start with Ron Graham, who's here in the audience, and Peter Pearson, who are the originators of this idea. It was the two of them that thought, uh, as close friends of Margaret and Graham, they thought it was high time that Margaret and Graham's contribution to Canadian literature and to Canadian life uh, should be celebrated. And this year is also a very uh, significant birthdays for Margaret, and, and, and it was for Graham as well. And over two years ago, Ron and, and uh, Peter went to Margaret and Graham and suggested that perhaps a documentary could be made, and thus we are here tonight. To Margaret and, and to Graham, we want to thank them for allowing us to follow them for what is pro perhaps one of uh, Margaret's busiest years of her entire life. They were so patient and kind to us, always greeting us with a smile, and they were very generous to Peter and I and all of the crew. And uh, Margaret has said, uh, she said it to us while we were following and traipsing around behind her, that it is better to travel than to arrive. Very, very wise words. And uh, we want to thank her and Graham still for our travels together and what a privilege it was an adventure for us. But I have to say, as much as we love to travel, we are very happy to arrive tonight. <laughs> and have this done, and uh, Margaret will be very happy to know that we won't be jumping out from behind the bushes anymore. So thank you, enjoy the film, and we'll see you after. So it was a good idea to make this film, but of course you need money, and uh, so we're very grateful to the CBC. Uh, Sally Cata was here, and Jen Detman, and Barb Williams, who, who's, who's come to the CBC, Thank you so much for your support of our endeavors and your patience with us. Yes, public broadcasting. To the National Film Board of Canada, who, where I started making films when I was 21 years old, they hired this kid to be an editor, and, uh, and I was there for seven years. And you'll see footage in this film that has never been seen before. The, the negative had never even been printed of a film that was made about Margaret Atwood in 1986. 84, by Mike Rubo, an NFB film, and so the film board became a partner in this project, um, and they'll be doing some of the educational distribution. To Robin Mursky from Rogers, uh, Rogers has been so supportive of, of documentary filmmaking in this country for many years. Uh, to the CMF, of course, and Telefilm, Stephanie Azam, I think you're here. To Ontario Creates, very important funding for, especially for theatrical documentaries, which of course this is, to the people at Penguin Random House and all the others that helped us along the way. Thank you so much for all your support and patience. And uh, we hope you enjoy the film. We'll be back up here for uh, Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much for coming. Um, all right, I have to make, I have to tell you something, first of all, before we start this, um, which is that I, I'm, I said something that's not true at the beginning, and um, they've asked me to find some very um, subtle way of correcting some information. And um, I have to say there is no subtle way of correcting this. Um, I said that there was a reception afterwards that was for everybody. <laughs> You're not invited. <laughs> All right, there's no polite way of doing that, is there? I mean, there's just... But it's late anyways, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> you got to get home. And it might snow. You never know. No, the film is the best part. So thank you. And thank you both for this extraordinary film. I, <laughs> I yes. Thank you very much. Nancy. Lovely um, to show it here in this beautiful theater. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the sound was so good. And, uh, of yeah. course, it won't be the same. When, well, it'll be just the same when you watch it on CBC, honestly. <laughs> One of the things that, of course, strikes me as being an, a, an interviewer myself is that um, we all know that it's... I've, I've interviewed politicians. I've interviewed terrorists. I've interviewed mass killers. 
nobody intimidates me more than interviewing Margaret Atwood. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you approached this with much trepidation. Uh, how, 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 how intimidating was it? Well, especially after we saw the Hannah Garter interview. <laughs> Wasn't that, it was like a car accident, right? Have you, have you, if you, anyone's, go on, oh, it feels so badly for Hannah. But you, if you go on and look at the whole thing, is I remember watching it in real time, and it really was like a, a, like a rubberneck. You, you knew you, you wanted to turn away, but you kept watching because uh, you should never say to Margaret, um, you know, why don't you ever write anything that's nice that has a happy ending? You know, I've uh, had the privilege and opportunity to make films in... Uh, in Nicaragua during the Sandinista Revolution, in Rwanda after the genocide. You also wrote about General Dallaire in the Arctic in tough conditions, but uh, I'm never, <laughs> I've never been more frightened going into a film than this one, <laughs> uh, uh, trying to make a, a good film about Margaret Atwood. It's very, it was very scary. But, but very quickly, uh, she opened up and, and, and gave us opportunities to, just, just to back up a bit, when after Ron uh, Graham and Peter Pearson had suggested we go ahead with it, and, and Graham and Margaret graciously allowed us to, to, to go ahead and make the film, Margaret was very clear, and she said, I have a book to finish. I, this was the beginning of, of 2019, and she said, I can't give you an interview until next year, but we needed to go ahead and make the film. And, and she said, you're welcome to follow me and, and Graham as we, as we travel, but I cannot give you an interview. And so that was sort of a, a bit of a daunting task, but what that constraint meant was that uh, it forced us to start to look at archival interviews, and, and there was such a, a gold mine of wonderful things. And we thought, wouldn't it be lovely to see more of Margaret as she, as she grew up? And so um, thanks to the diligence of some researchers that are here with us tonight, all of this lovely material came to light. And I think it's lovely to see her as a young woman, you know, in her reading it, dangerous to read newspapers, and seeing her as, as she's grown up. I want to ask you a lot about that in a moment. But I just uh, one of the other things you had, obviously, it, it, there was you had tremendous access, and Margaret and Graham were very generous with you. Obviously, you, you they obviously liked having you around. They're in their their kitchen, and uh, well, okay, <laughs> no, I know it. And, well, of course not. But but you also were able to speak with so many of their friends who obviously trusted you. And there, I just one of my my favorite remarks, and I think everyone was laughing in the audience when this came up. When when Jim Polk said, Margaret was very sexy in ways only someone from Canada or Montana could understand. Jim is here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And so that, that was extremely helpful, wasn't it, that, that people were, were so open to telling you the stories about her. No one turned us down, eh? You, we, you know, you're making a film about Margaret Atwood. How can we help? We'd like to be interviewed. We'd like to give you photos we might have of her from the old days and that sort of thing. So... And thank you to the family that are here. So Margaret's oh, sister boy. Ruth is here. And, and Harold. Where are you? And Harold, her brother Harold are both over there. And, and Harold's Lenore, who gave us all that wonderful bird footage. Thank you. And, and Matthew Gibson is here with his wife and his son Rowan. So thank you all to the family that is here. The other, the other people who helped us, Carol, were filmmakers. I mean... There have been many, uh, Margaret's been in a lot of films over the years. Ron Mann made the, as I'm not sure if Ron's here, yeah. and uh, thank you, Ron, and Jennifer Bashwald and Nick DePoncia made the payback film, and that was that film board film that Mike Rubo made in 1986, and James and Bay Wayman made that film that had that footage of uh, Jack Clowns party. Which is, you, so you, there was all this stuff out there. Yeah, and you mentioned that there was one you, you found in the National Film Board archive, yeah. an undeveloped film. That which, was cool. which one was that? What, what were the well, it's a film called Once in August that Mike Rubo made in 1986, where he was invited to their private cottage up in the on the lake and arrived in a canoe, and Merrily Weisbord was working with Mike and the film board crew, and they shot all this footage, and they made a a film, uh, which I don't think she was very happy with, actually. Uh, but there was a lot of footage, of It was course, never released. You, shoot, never you, shoot, you shoot a lot of footage when you're yeah. making a film. And uh, we found that lovely scene of uh, Margaret's mother leading 
her her daughter and another little girl through the woods and he's and he finds this bug and that stuff uh, had never been uh, printed before and what about Mar margaret's mother in those pictures making pie <laughs> the, yeah. right, all the always recipes yeah. that start with, with quick quick <laughs> Had that been shown before? Had that was that some of that? Of some of that's in the in the film board film, but that's a long, long time ago. The other reason why I, I thought you might be um, you approach this making this film with trepidation is that for so many of us, and we see a lot of young women in the in this film, and we see them at the events, how much she matters to them. But there is a generation of women who. Are, for whom Margaret was d defining. I mean, the literature was absolutely something that al allowed us to understand our, our w how we could break out of molds, and that it, it just it, she matters so much to us. I mean, remember the university campuses, women going around with copies of uh, the Circle Game, like a fetish, carrying it around, and 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 surfacing and the edible woman. These books were defining for. A generation of women. So you, you you must know how much we are going to be watching this very carefully. Yeah, I agree about how important these books are. I mean, I I read her when I was in my twenties, and I've having reread them, I I see so much more complexity in relationships. Having gone through my own life, I I, I they're 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 very very powerful. And the one thing though that I didn't appreciate as fully as a young woman it was her humor. Yeah. And rereading them now, I ju they're just funny, funny, funny. I mean, in Hagseed, I don't know if any of you have read Hagseed. I just, I was just split and open, right? It's a wonderful read. I highly recommend it if you want to laugh hard. And, and, and women of, of, of your generation, but young, young women today, t t teenagers and women in their 20s, they're reading her. They're, they, she tweets in the morning. I, I'm on Margaret's Twitters, you know, and the, before 9 o'clock in the morning, there's like 20 of them out there. She's retweeting people who have written a new book or some cause that she cares about or something else mm -hmm. that she's read. And a lot of people uh, read these. She has over 2 million uh, Twitter yeah. followers now. So Even 7-year-old girls read her. <laughs> yes, right. Well, <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that. <laughs> and, and then, you, of course, I, I couldn't believe that you actually had one of the, my favorite lines of Margaret's poetry. And I, I want to, I, also, I want to admire you for doing, dealing so much with poetry, because for so many of us, it began with the poetry. I mean, before the fiction. But that there is this one line of a poem, you fit into me like a hook into an eye, a fish hook, an open eye, that I have carried with me, with me since for, for, for decades now. And there it was, and, and just connecting with so many of us. I, I think you, many of you, I could hear the ahs and laughter and of so many people in the audience who were feeling the same way. And I might say, it's the genius of, of Kathy Gulkin, who's our editor, Kathy and, and, and Catherine Lyons, who are both here somewhere in the audience. It's very hard for us to see you out there. There you are. To, you know, to use Margaret Atwood's watercolors yeah. with the, uh, you fit into me, like, oh my God. Uh, th those two worked in the cutting room for eight months, struggling with this material uh, and creating, you know, what you've seen, which I think, you know, it works really well. Weaving in those two strands, like the contemporary footage of us following her around and the history, really, of Margaret's literary career. And, and though we are intimidated by her, it's astonishing, isn't it, the numbers of people who will walk up and begin to talk to her and feel a kind of ownership. And, um, and she's so generous with people. I'm always yeah. astonished. The people, like the man I, I, I was forced to read you in grade 12, and, or <laughs> someone saying, I've heard people say, I've, I've never read you, but my daughter seems to think you're great, and can you sign my boarding pass, you know? I mean, and she's absolutely, and she does. I mean, isn't she's just so generous with these people. That, that's what several people that work with her in the publishing world uh, have said to us, that they never, ever saw Margaret lose it with a fan. No matter how inconvenient, how tired she was, how many things she had to do, she always gives time to her readers, and I think she has a deep appreciation for her readers, and we, we saw it everywhere, her, her genuine interest and, and, and the time she gave to them. One fan, if I, if I could just say a, a little story, when we uh, were with her in Amsterdam, and she gave this speech that you see at the Nexus Institute where she says, I'm from another planet and stuff, and dressed up as a, a, 
And, um, but the next, that evening she said, well, we, we said, what are you going to do tomorrow? She said, well, I think I'll go to the Rijksmuseum and look at the Rembrandts and the Vermeers and stuff. Well, we didn't know she was going to do that. And uh, the next day was a Sunday and you need permission that you have to write weeks in advance to film inside the Rijksmuseum. And the guy who ran the Nexus Institute knew board members, but they were all on holiday, and it was impossible. So There's no way you're going to get in no there. No way you're going to get into that place following Margaret Atwood. So our fixer, we sent our fixer over in, in advance, and he goes up to the security desk, and he says, I've got Margaret Atwood. I've got this film crew all the way from Canada. Do you think we could possibly allow us in here for half an hour? And they said, um, of course not. I mean, you have to write all these... In the back of the security office, the head of security came. Mm -hmm. He heard the name Margaret Atwood, and he comes forward and he says, my wife likes Margaret Atwood's books. <laughs> he said, I'd be delighted to personally escort Miss Atwood around, and the film crew can tag along too. So, oh my God, this is a lucky break for us. And that's the scene where there's somebody from the bookstore in Montreal who comes up that's and right. uh, yeah, yeah. becomes so intimate with her <laughs> immediately. Um, there, uh, going back to the extraordinary footage you found and some of those pictures of the Bohemian Embassy and those, those the coffee, coffee clubs and um, the poetry readings and all of that, I mean, it must have been just a delight to find those archives. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was Nancy's job. She's really good at that. Yeah, but can I show you my favorite find? So... Oh, so Margaret's inspiration for the, for the costume of the handmaid. We were down in the States, and essentially, if I, uh, antique store is a bit of a stretch. I, it's more on the flea market end, walking through, because I love looking at junk and old things. And lo and behold, in one of the shelves, amongst hundreds of things, there was this Dutch cleanser. <laughs> and I was so excited, and, and we bought it, and the guy was sort of puzzled why we would want this thing. But we were flying back to Canada, and I thought, I don't know how we're going to get it back to Canada, but I put, I put it in my checked bag because I, I, sh I sh surely knew that a, in a carry-on it wouldn't, it wouldn't make <laughs> the grade. And when I got it's back to... to explain why you'd have that. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> when I got back to Toronto, I opened my suitcase, and it was rifled apart. Everything was torn apart. But on the top of it was a, was a letter from the Homeland Security. <laughs> and they had obviously uh, saw this in the, in, in, in the x-ray machine and hauled it out and had a look. And I, I, thank God they didn't think it was cocaine. But it, we were so excited to get this back. Or anthrax. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. And uh, <laughs> we are going to give this to Margaret. And my hope is that eventually it'll go into her archives at Thomas Fisher rare book as, a, as an item of interest, as a, a, a you know, part of a research for Handmaid's Tale. Um, and so and th all those, those pictures are from the, the time. I mean, she's in them. I mean, I didn't even know that such films existed. Did, did you? And, Mar and, and Nancy also spent days uh, in Margaret's basement, Margaret and Graham's basement, boxes and boxes of photographs that had never been mm -hmm. scanned before and now there's this archive really that you've created well and what's really fun is to see her manuscripts at thomas fisher you know today with computers the writing is going to be lost but there you can see the process of how she wrote the first page of the handmaid's tale and how it evolved because she's all these these you know different parts of of um how she writes she, she rewrites and rewrites and it's really interesting to see how she works yeah, I, I, it's, it's like a puzzle trying to figure out with the arrows going everywhere. But it wasn't even called The Handmaid's Tale originally. It was called Offred. Yes. <laughs> and then I, di I didn't know that until I saw the, the first manuscript, yeah. that it was titled Offred. Um, Peter just mentioned her, uh, Margaret's tweeting. And this is one of the things that I think many of us admire so much about Margaret Atwood is that she spends her political capital. I mean, she... Are, she, is, she is so famous, world famous, you could even get into museums because, of, because people read her. <laughs> but at the same time, she, she will turn that around and use it for the causes of her time. And she champions those. When I saw that, and that's the most famous moments when Margaret said, what have the police got against cleanliness during the bathhouse raids? And I remember that at the time. Mm. And already she was just so Im important as a writer. And then I thought, yes. That is another thing you, another obligation we have as people, and uh, and, and and so you, you w w and I wonder if, if as you were watching that, you were collecting that. Why do you think she didn't 
she could have just stayed in her ivory tower. She could have just rested on her laurels. Why do you think she didn't? You tell people about sitting with Graham at the book signing in Cooperstown. That's so telling. Oh, uh, we were watching the the book signing, and I I often sat with Graham, and and uh, we were having a beer and and just waiting because there was a very long line of people waiting to talk to Margaret, and I asked Graham, "How does she find the stamina? Why does she why does she do that?" and um, he just said she feels it's uh, it's her responsibility. She's got a lot of work to do, and it's her responsibility. There is uh, we're, you mentioned the numbers of people who are in the film who are in this room. It's a bit like you know, Woody Allen movie where you know. Well, how do you know that? Well, I happen to have Marshall McLuhan behind this body <laughs> plant you know, because everyone's here who can attest to this. But the one person who is not in this room and um, and it's but is so much in this film and so much in the people's lives is Graham Gibson. And um, I think the most difficult and the most beautiful parts of your film are when you you spent much of the, uh, well, you saw the last year of his life and last year of them together. Mm. And uh, that must have been deeply affecting for it's both of you. It's a love story, really. You know, when, when, when uh, Peter uh, Pearson and Ron Graham suggested we make this film and Margaret and Graham agreed, uh, Margaret said, you've got to interview Graham because he's, you know, he has dementia and he's losing his memory. And Shelley Saywell, who's here, who's a wonderful filmmaker, came uh, to uh, their house uh, with irising and, 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 and did the interview with, with, with Graham. And uh, we're so grateful that that was done. Quickly. Because there's such intimacy to that, and and yeah. I, and he's so generous in that. So and I I can see that that uh, Shelley would have been able to bring that out in him, mm. and so uh, thank you. I'm I'm grateful that you were there in that last year to capture so much of him. So many people here, I'm sure, feel the same way. I want to ask if there are some questions from the audience. We have a few minutes for that. And this gentleman here, oh, there's a microphone you're supposed to get. I think yes. You, you can have one of ours. Oh, someone's coming. No, look at that. First of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, the, uh, bringing this uh, great uh, documentary film to us. And um, thank uh, Ms. Uh, Atwood, uh, Ms. Atwood for um, making the iconic hands made uh, tale. And uh, uh, partly it's based on her life experiences, partly on her knowledge gained, and partly exaggeration of the truth how women are oppressed, or how they were oppressed in the past, and how they, they are still oppressed. oppressed the president in certain um, edges of the world, a bit exaggerated, and the iconic red uh, outfits and the white bonnets, it's like uniforms, you know, it's like stormtroopers in Star Wars. And, you, and when you see a stormtrooper in a Star Wars film, you immediately know what they are. It's the same with with the handmade uniforms. Can you, wait, can you s what is your question? Yeah, my question. Um, it is a compliment. Oh, okay. And um, you, and you said. Uh, Thank you. And uh, you said. Uh, at the beginning, before the movie, that um, she never likes to arrive, she likes to travel, and I guess traveling, her journey of life, is what inspires her to write mm -hmm. all the time, and I hope she n never arrives and keeps uh -huh. traveling yeah. and keeps coming with these creative ideas. Right. And, uh, That's lovely, thank and you. And since uh, you were, I want to ask about that can, um, has a, the Dutch um, outfit. Um, you said you, were in, uh, you got that from US, but you were in Amsterdam, why'd you get it from there? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe just one last question out there. Just a, uh, you can, can can you confine it to a question if it's possible? There's a lady there. Okay. Thank you. Um, I I felt so jealous when Margaret made the comment about um, mathematics in relation to writing. Um, I I no matter what I do, I'll never be good at math. Um, <laughs> but. Um, it reminded me of something interesting a few years back that uh, wasn't mentioned in the film, but do you know anything about it? Um, I remember being asked to sign something online and that it referred to a special tool that had been developed by Margaret Atwood oh. called a quill signature. <laughs> um, and of course I loved seeing the, the quill pen that she was using and talking about. Does that ring a bell, or did you ever discuss it with her? Well, Matthew should speak to that. Matthew, where are you? There he is. Matthew is actually, it's called the long pen, and it was a brilliant invention. And it, can you pass the microphone to Matthew? He can explain better than anyone. This is what Matthew this Gibson was. back there. Uh, good evening. Um, 
yeah, the, the long pen actually um, originated, again, by Margaret's creativity and imagination when a FedEx driver showed up on her front door back in roughly 2004. And um, when she signed the little signing pad, she thought her signature was flying through the air to the FedEx office and that a pen was magically writing her signature onto a piece of paper. And that's really where the, the genesis of the idea came from. And over the years, uh, I mean, her vision was to be able to um, engage with her readers in parts of the world that she wouldn't otherwise be able to get to. And that would be done through video conferencing and the importance of being able to provide something physical, um, something tangible, a signature. And over the years, uh, we did over 50 high-profile events. Um, Edward Kennedy Jr., Margaret used it. Um, Norman Mailer's last public appearance was done using this, uh, the long pen. It's now grown into an e-signature company. The long pen is installed in governments. Um, it's got a life of its own now. Mm, great story. Mm. I'm going to ask the last question. What do you think Margaret will think of your documentary? <laughs> Oops. Can't really answer that. I hope. I hope. I hope she likes it. I mean, I, I think it'll be difficult for her to watch. I don't think she's seen it yet. Uh, you know, could get this a lot of Graham a through there. Graham. Yeah. What do you think, Nancy? What will she think? Well, I hope she uh, appreciates that. I, I mean, I, the last thing I would want to do is see myself on a big screen, and I, I, I'm not sure I'd want to watch a documentary about myself. But I think what we wanted to do was for everybody to understand what an extraordinary mind she is, uh, um, a writer, obviously, of poetry and uh, many different mediums. But more than anything, is she's such a compassionate person. And she really cares about uh, everyone around her and, and, and the planet. And, and I think at the end of the film, we put in, uh, when you see it on CBC and you can freeze frame it, we, we really wanted to promise to her that her causes and things that mattered to Graham and her were, were presented in the film. And we hope that she'll go and look at the websites of the organizations that she and, and Graham de deeply care about. Peter, any last words about what do you want people to take from this film? Well, you know, I, I think what she says at the end when she says, you know, students ask me what they should do, and people are looking for philosopher queens, as Nancy calls her, a philosopher queen, and some of the, uh, you know, elderly people in their, you know, Bernie Sanders and David Suzuki have become heroes to young, young, young people, and Margaret's one of those, and she says, vote, and she says, know the truth. And subscribe to a newspaper. And subscribe to a newspaper. And all this uh, just before her 80th birthday, which is next just, week. Just before we say goodbye, uh, Carol, if you don't mind, there's people in the in, in here who made the... I mean, there's just two of us sitting up here, Nancy and I, but filmmaking is a team sport, as you know. And John Westhauser's here, who's the cinematographer and who's gone all over the world with me making films. And he did an extraordinary job on this film. And he lives across the street from me, and he's oh, at the door. Oh, yes, he does. He's your neighbor. And sitting beside John is, is Peter Sawadi, who's the sound recordist. And the quality of the sound is extraordinary. Wherever we went with Margaret, you know, she'd, see, she'd come over to us at these events, and she'd immediately, you know, where's the radio mic? And she'd pin it, you know, Peter would pin it on her so we could pick up her intimate conversation. She was so open and, and, and wonderful to deal with in that way. And, and, and the, the, the people at SIM who did all the Jane Tattersall and Lou and her team, that, that team, and Arlene Mokler who did the color correction. And then Todor, we'd never worked with Todor before. He wrote the music for this film, mm. which is very subtle yes. and very, very beautiful. And my father in high school played the cello in the, in the choir in, in um, the orchestra in Cardiff, Wales. And so it um, chokes me up that Todor put a lot of cello in this film, this very emotional instrument. So anyway, I just wanted to well, thank, thanks the, to thank all our, of our team. Yeah, thank you to everyone who went, contributed to this film, including those people here and um, many other places, because it really is really important to all of us. And thank you for being such a great audience. This has been terrific. Applause thank you very for them, much. Applause for you. Thank you. Yeah. And good night.